You'd think monsters down here in the south would be afraid or at least hesitant to walk up on someone in the woods. Cause down here everybody's got a massive buck knife and is dual wielding 12 gauges. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails, where I tweeted about a hero dog that took on almost a dozen coyotes alone and won. Today I've prepared for you some terrifying stories of unexplained creatures seen in the south. There will be two tall wolves, shadow monsters, and wendigos, of course. Enjoy, and be sure to send me your scary stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. And don't forget to check out eeriecast.com to enjoy and support my other shows. Now, let's begin. How I Lost My Leg From Anonymous I won't lie to you. This is a strange thing for me to finally talk about after all these years. For the sake of mine and my brother's privacy, names and locations will be changed. You can call me Jake, and my brothers, James, Justin, and Jackson. About six years ago, my father passed away in a tragic car accident. Dead on impact, is what they said. Didn't feel a thing. Although I did find some comfort in the fact he didn't suffer, it was still a massive loss for the family. My father was a great man. He was a doting father to his four boys and a loving husband to our mother. He had strong arms and a pure heart, going out of his way to improve the lives of everyone around him. He was there to teach and shape us in every step of growing up, and we all carried his best qualities in life. The summer after his passing, my oldest brother James suggested that we go camping to honor his memory. The four of us agreed, of course. Setting aside our commitments for one measly weekend was a small price to pay. It meant we could go do the thing he loved the most together. Personally, I had no conflicts, being a salary man that had weekends off anyway. James was between jobs at the moment and thought that the trip would be a good way to realign his energies. Justin had to simply cancel a few work meetings and explain multiple times to his partner that he wasn't allowed to go. That weekend was just for us. Jackson, however, had just gotten married to his wife about a month prior to our trip. So he had the most difficult time trying to get away. His wife was still very much in the honeymoon phase and could not stand the thought of being apart for more than 24 hours. When the time finally arrived, we had all gathered up our old camping gear, then piled into Jackson's SUV. The trip was going to take about two hours, but we didn't mind. We used that time to catch up and laugh. By the time we arrived at Dad's favorite camping site, the sun was already going down. The temperature out there in the mountains drops quickly at night, so we rushed to get our tents set up and our fire going. I, unfortunately, by then was very drunk and ended up snapping one of my tent poles, leaving my shelter in a useless heap on the forest floor. Thankfully, James had my back and he didn't mind sharing his tent with me. It was the only two-person tent anyway, but still, it was a kind gesture. Another hour passed and we were all set up. We sat around the fire telling ghost stories over s'mores. It couldn't have been more perfect. The cool night air was fresh, alive with chirping insects and the hoots of owls. I think it was the buzz I had going, but I thought that the owl sounded sick or something. Its hoots sounded more like a gasp, a death rattle. I shook my head clear of the morbid thoughts and looked up at the sky. The stars shimmered down upon us, bright and beautiful, as we enjoyed our brotherly bonding. Jackson and I both tried and failed miserably to tell a scary story. I couldn't stop laughing long enough to be ominous and spooky, while Jackson just simply sucked at storytelling. We would constantly forget the lines and we weren't able to make it make sense. We booed him, lovingly, until he stopped and gave up, opting instead to make us more. Hey, Justin said suddenly, quickly putting on a serious expression. Did Dad ever tell you guys about the thing that lives out here. 
There were some murmurs as we all looked at each other, confused. Uh, no, haven't heard that one, Jackson responded, crossing his arms. James and I agreed, pondering why we hadn't heard the story as well. Justin sighed deeply and looked up, meeting each of our eyes before he continued. It was my 18th birthday. He and I made a deal that, to celebrate, we'd go camping just the two of us. James rolled his eyes and smirked. Yeah, cause you always needed extra help with everything, Cupcake. He had to teach you how to be more manly. Justin narrowed his eyes at our eldest brother and pointed the sharp end of his marshmallow skewer at him. Hey, I'm not the one that ruined a whole tent because a snake scared the literal pee out of him. We laughed as James put his hands up in defeat. All right, you got me. Continue with your story. Justin took another few moments to look around at us before he decided we were done interrupting and continued. We arrived here, of course. It's always been Dad's favorite spot. The second night we were out here, we began to hear these weird hooting noises. I kept trying to explain it away as a sick or injured owl, but it just never sounded right. The third night, Dad came and woke me up. When I looked at him, he was all panicked and sweaty. The look in his eyes as he told me to grab my bag. It was the scariest freaking thing I've ever seen. He never answered my questions, just locked me in the car and grabbed what he could of our stuff as fast as he could. I felt a twinge on the back of my neck as my brother spoke. Did I not hear a sick sounding owl just earlier? He continued. After we began driving back, Dad started to speed as soon as we hit the main road. The ride back was silent. Eventually, finally, he turned to me and asked if I saw it. I told him no, of course, and he just nodded and looked back at the road. I never knew what it was that he was talking about, what he saw. The silence was deafening as he finished the story. Jackson sat still, not realizing his marshmallow was still in the fire burning. James broke the silence before I could. No way, is that why we never came back here? I thought Dad just got too old and tired to keep roughing it like this. I nodded in agreement, just now realizing that he was correct. For the past four years until my father's untimely passing, he had simply refused to go camping here again, no matter how much we begged him. I'm surprised he never told you all that was the reason, Justin said softly. Then again, I bet he didn't want to sound senile. I'm not sure why, but I lifted my beer up at the moment and smiled, sadly. Well then, I said, this one's for you, Dad. We've come to reclaim your beloved camping site, Monster Be Darned. My brothers all cheered and clinked their bottles and cans to mine as we all took a deep pool of our beverages. Later that night, Jackson and James put out the fire as Justin and I hid away the food in the bear bag. We all said goodnight then, and drunkenly stumbled our separate ways to our tents. As I unrolled my sleeping bag and got settled in, James entered the tent. His eyes were red and he looked absolutely beat. We gave one last goodnight to each other and let the alcohol rock us to sleep as the wind rustled our tent. Some time later, I awoke with a headache and a very full bladder. Quietly, I got up, trying my best not to disturb my sleeping brother as I exited the tent, walking a good distance away to try and find a private spot to do my business. Once I had relieved myself, I picked up on a strange sound. No, wait, there was no sound. The woods were dead silent. My heart began to race as my camper's instinct kicked in. A completely silent forest is a deadly forest. I pressed my back up against the tree I just peed on and stayed as still and quiet as possible. Out of the dead silence, there came a slight rustle, then a hoot of what sounded like a sick owl. My blood went cold. 
I slowly glanced above me, the hair on the back of my neck raising up in a primitive warning. Then our eyes met. That thing in the tree. It was pale, eyes black as the night. It slowly crawled down the trunk of the tree straight towards me, long fingers and arms reaching out, both thin yet lean with muscle. It opened its disgusting mouth, lined with rows of sharp teeth, and let out that horrible noise again, louder this time, almost as if it was taunting me. In that moment with this horrible creature making its way to me, the flight instinct finally kicked in. I screamed bloody murder and began to huff it, the thing hooting in excitement as it chased behind me. I felt tears falling down my face as I ran, my legs and lungs burning, my heart pounding. Right as I was almost back to the site, I felt something hit me square in the back. It had caught me. It had pounced and knocked me flat on my face, claws digging into me. I screamed again, in pain this time, feeling teeth sinking into the meat of my calf. I felt flesh and muscle tear as it jerked its head back. I couldn't run anymore. It had crippled me. I gave up. I had no energy to fight, no way to run. All I could do was lie there and wait as this thing began to eat me. In a sudden flash of red, Jackson appeared out of nowhere in his long johns, tackling the creature off of me. Get him up and run! He screamed. He then turned and planted the head of our hatchet between the thing's shoulder blades, causing it to shriek and hoot in pain. I felt the arms of James and Justin lifting me up, all but dragging me to the SUV as we clambered away, Jackson right on our heels. The drive to the hospital was a blur. I felt nauseous, coming in and out of consciousness as my brothers tried to keep me awake. Justin tied his shirt around my calf. I'd lost a lot of blood. The area of the bite burned. I awoke in the hospital bed sometime later. James was by my side and quickly called down the hall, bringing in the rest of my brothers and our mom. They all spoke to me softly, gently preparing me for the news that I had lost my leg. Apparently in the span of 24 hours and despite the doctor's best efforts, it had become so infected they had to amputate. In an effort to not sound insane, my siblings offered some BS story about how I got my calf caught in an illegal bear trap and I tried to walk it off for a few days. They left out the monster and made me sound incompetent, but it was better to be dumb than a loon. After all these years, I've finally gotten used to the prosthetic leg. I'm fully mobile and enjoy all the comforts and activities of a normal life. I will offer one piece of advice. Please, just please, think twice before you delve into the deep of the dark woods. You can never guarantee that you are truly alone. The Thing I Saw in My Front Yard From Duane The story begins in October of 2021. I was watching over my parents' home while my mom was in the county hospital due to a lung disease called pulmonary fibrosis. It's tough to know that one day you'll smother to death from lack of oxygen. However, this story begins at my family home in South Central Kentucky. I own the place now, a 10-acre small farming homestead that's been in the family since 1974, just after my parents were married. It's situated right there on the Tennessee-Kentucky line. So on that night, my baby brother, who has since passed on from this life to the next, was with me. While everyone else was at the hospital with my mom, we were about to go to bed. I lay down, but I couldn't seem to fall asleep. I had this feeling of dread and uncomfortableness seeming to engulf my mind. I couldn't shake it off. I couldn't drift off to sleep. So I got up from my warm bed. It was a somewhat cool night, so I wrapped up in a blanket to stay warm. I walked over to my desk and sat down to read for a while. 
As I was reading, I heard something outside the front door. Something like a whistling sound, or some sort of long chirp. It kept getting louder as I sat there, very tired from all the work I'd done that day. Finally, the noise got so loud, I rose from my seat and walked over to the front door. Now, my parents had a very tall flower stand in the front yard, which was seven feet and six inches tall from top to base. This is where things get a bit hairy. So I looked out the front door. Lo and behold, I see this huge black figure. It was at least a foot taller than the flower stand. I know this because the figure was standing not two feet from it. As I unlocked the door, as quietly as possible, I stared at this thing for what seemed like forever, before it suddenly began to walk away from the stand to the back of an old worn-down garage that my grandpa built in the 80s for my dad. Then it was out of sight. My mom, my dad, and baby brother are all gone now. It's only me and my two girls left. This thing didn't look like anything I've seen before. It wasn't a Bigfoot, it didn't have antlers, it was just huge, hairy, and black as coal. I didn't see its face at all. It had moved to the other side of the road and into the forest. I've never seen this thing since then. If anyone has any information on this, let me know. Birthday Gift from Miss Mario too. This happened in October of 2021. I've lived in North Alabama my entire life, save for living in Mississippi when I had college classes. I'm a girl, but I've always been a sort of son to my parents, especially my dad. He had raised me hunting and fishing every chance we could get. He taught me how to walk quietly in the woods, how to stop every few steps to look around and listen to the woods and your surroundings. You'd think that with his background, I'd be pretty comfortable spending my time in wooded areas or just in rural outdoor areas in general. For the most part, I am. However, I get really intense paranoia when I'm in the woods after dark and I never venture out without a firearm. After this experience, I'll never again question my preservation instincts. The night of my last birthday, my boyfriend surprised me with a little trip to a secluded riverbank, where he and I had gone hammocking before, as well as where my dad and I had spent many fishing excursions. He pulled into the boat ramp parking lot, turning into a smaller side road, and parked his truck with the tailgate facing the river and the hood right against the tree line. It was about 8 p.m. then, so it was already dark out, which put me on edge just a little bit upon arriving at the riverbank. I tried not to get too scared, though, and I focused on enjoying the evening my boyfriend had set up for us. He came prepared with an endless supply of goodies for me. Slice of cake, my favorite candy, soda, cheesecake, and he even blew up an air mattress for us to lay on in the bed of his truck. We stayed there listening to music, talking and enjoying each other's company for about half an hour before a cop rolled into the parking lot. Knowing we weren't doing anything wrong, we didn't even have alcohol or anything of the sort, we exchanged small talk with the cop when he came to see what we were doing. Well, this is new, he said at first, referring to a couple of teenagers on an air mattress in a truck bed on the riverbank at night. We laughed a bit with him, acknowledging that the situation probably seemed a little odd. But after some general exchanges with the cop, he ended the conversation with, All right then, y'all be careful out here. Some crazy crap's been going on lately. Don't want y'all to get caught up in anything. We gave him a brief, Yes sir, will do, as he got back in his car and pulled out of the parking lot. At this point, we had stuffed ourselves with cake and various other goodies, so we decided to just lie down together and look at the stars. A bit of time passed as we did so, and I'd become entirely at ease with being out there in the dark. I trusted my boyfriend. He's had a few more intense encounters than I have with wildlife and just generally creepy situations in rural areas, so I felt safe with him. That was 
until twigs snapped from within the tree line that the hood of the truck was butted right up against. I shut up mid-sentence when I heard it. My boyfriend and I lay there still and silent while we waited to hear the noise again. Now I've heard my share of animals in the woods, and I also know the general mannerisms of the animals we have in that area. For instance, I'd heard packs of coyotes howling along that same riverbank before, but I didn't think one lone coyote would venture so close to us with our music and lights from the truck. We don't have any large predators either. The occasional bobcat would come around, but they tended to be pretty shy, and any cat would definitely make sure to be completely silent when approaching something they weren't sure about. Some rustling went on from the same direction as the original twig snap, and I whispered to my boyfriend, almost inaudibly, What was that? He briefly put a hand over my mouth, a gesture telling me not to make a sound, which put my heart rate through the roof. We lay there, listening to what sounded like footsteps heading toward the parking lot along the tree line. This absolutely freaked me out. Whatever it was, be it a regular animal or something else, it was very close to us, and we were lying out in the open. These sounds traveled out of earshot, but we remained still and quiet for a bit longer to make sure whatever it was had gone far enough away from us for us to safely move around without imminent threat. I was close to tears by then, anxiously suggesting to my boyfriend that we should pack it up and leave, while he insisted that we would probably be fine staying a little longer. I felt awful about wanting to cut our night short, because his birthday surprise for me was really sweet, but my gut just was not having it. Reluctantly, he gave in to my suggestion of leaving. We packed everything back into the truck, me constantly looking around and listening every minute or so until the only thing left to take was the air mattress. I'd leaned up against the side of the truck bed as he hooked up the pump to take the air out when a goose called out from the riverbank about 10 yards from us. Not thinking much of it, we continued packing up until we heard a more frantic goose call. And my boyfriend jumped out of the truck with a hasty, that goose is being attacked. Get in the truck. He didn't have to tell me twice. From inside the closed vehicle doors, we listened as this goose on the bank screamed out several more times before being cut off mid-scream, having been finally killed. I was terrified at the moment. I couldn't make sense of why any normal animal would be so bold as to approach our vehicle, then actively kill another animal within a short distance of us. This thing didn't seem to have any fear. Sitting in silent panic as my boyfriend rubbed my arm to comfort me, he never got scared in situations like that, we allowed some time to pass before he said he would go back out and finish taking care of the air mattress. I was scared for him, imagining all kinds of scenarios where he could be attacked by something as I sat in the truck. I knew he had to get everything situated so we could drive away though so I watched through the back window and even cracked my door to keep an eye on him. Soon he finished with the air mattress and he just sat it in the back seat. That's when a huffing sound came from the bank where we'd heard the goose dying. My adrenaline went insane then. I called out to him urgently and semi-quietly to get his butt back in the truck, but instead he pulled out his flashlight and shined it along the bank walking slowly in that direction. That idiot, I was thinking. I'd rather not sit here and witness his brutal death by some animal or thing, whatever it is. He stepped toward the parking lot, still shining the light down the bank. Then he stopped, and he said, I see it. He spoke so calmly. I urged him again to get back to the truck, which this time he finally listened. Once he was in the truck with the door shut, I asked him what it was. Was it a coyote? A cougar? He cocked his head. Uh, no, no, neither of those. It was dark and low to the ground and pretty big too. That made up my mind. 
I told him to drive us out of there that instant, and he obliged. I never saw the thing he described, and I'm glad I didn't. My boyfriend has always internalized any fear or strong emotion, so I don't think his mild reaction to the encounter was phony. Later on, he admitted to me that he acted that way so I wouldn't get any more scared than I already was. I have no idea what it was that was lurking around us that night, but I'm grateful my birthday evening didn't turn out morbid. What's in my forest? From Basic Peaches I'm a female, and I moved to Florida a couple of years ago. I never once thought that something sinister could ever dwell in my area, but I guess I was wrong. I discovered it very quickly after moving here. My family doesn't own a farm, but we do have plenty of animals. Chickens, geese, cats, and dogs, to name just a few. My cats and dogs normally stay inside, so they were never touched. But the chickens and geese were often mutilated by something, beyond recognition. Most of the time, just the feathers would be left, and maybe a foot or a wing. Logically, this could be explained as a raccoon or a bobcat. But when the geese began to go missing, that had to be something different. For the people who don't know, pilgrim geese are big birds. They're loud when they get attacked but several of our full-grown adults went missing without a trace. Obviously, they could have flown off, but we kept their wings clipped so they couldn't. However, the screaming, that is what gave me the 100% assurance that something wasn't right in those woods, because something out there would scream, and it sounded like a child and a woman being murdered in the most cruel ways. I asked my neighbors, but of course it was the usual stay out of the woods at night that they answered with. Fast forward a couple of years, and this creature had just become part of the regular for me, and for some reason I never thought of it much anymore. My parents were leaving town for about two weeks. They did this yearly, sometimes twice a year, so leaving me by myself was never an issue. I wasn't a party person, and they had no reason to distrust me. The first rule I disobeyed, though, was the have-no-people-over rule. About two hours after they left, I started up my car and went to go get my girlfriend and a few others. We did what most teenagers do. Smoked and drank, but nothing super extreme. That first night, we just hung out. Skip ahead to the third night. It was just me and my girlfriend, Alice. Alice and I were just lazing around the house, when she brought up the idea to go for a walk. At the time, it was 2 a.m., so I figured what was the worst that could happen. I didn't live in the middle of nowhere, but far enough in my little community that some people didn't even know there were houses towards the woods. We ventured out and were having fun, when she turned to me and suggested, we should go in the woods. For three nights in a row, we could hear the screaming all throughout the night, and I thought that would be the last place she'd want to go. But we did anyway, my naivete telling me that this creature probably lived deeper in the woods than we were going to go. We set out, using our phone flashlights, giggling and holding each other's hands. We'd only been dating for a few months, so we were still in the honeymoon phase. I was enjoying myself. Overall, it was a perfect summer night. We walked far into the woods, and we soon found a clearing. Alice skipped to the middle of it and spun around with a smile. I had not yet stepped into the clearing when I got that uneasy sensation. I have terrible anxiety, so I brushed it off as Alice making me nervous. She giggled at me and said, take a picture. I promptly took out a disposable camera and snapped a picture. I walked over towards her, tucking the camera in my hoodie pocket and holding her in a tight hug. Her head rested on mine since she was a little bit taller. She took a deep breath which made me look up at her and her looking down at me. I love you, she said with a smile. In that moment I was so happy. My heart fluttered and I opened my mouth to say it back, 
when to the left of me, a voice spoke, I love you. It came in my girlfriend's exact tone, but it sounded so distorted. It felt as if my heart dropped right into my stomach. I could tell hers did too, as her smile disappeared. I looked towards the voice, and it felt as if my heart had tumbled out of my body and onto the forest floor. In the light of the full moon, this thing, a buck, stood just outside the clearing. But there was something wrong with it, all wrong. It stood on its hind legs like a man. Its lips had been curled back into a smile with rows and rows of sharp teeth, and a tongue hung out, dripping with saliva. That's when I realized the bird noises, the crickets in the forest, had gone completely dead silent. The wind pushed towards the buck, which pushed the scent of decay away from us and further back. I pushed Alice behind me, like my five foot six self was going to do anything to protect her. I love you, Vina. It spoke and used the nickname Alice had given me. It stepped out into the clearing. It must have been seven feet tall. Its arms and legs were too long for its body, and its body didn't even look like it was alive. It was so skinny, to the point where the bones cut out through the skin of the deer. Alice screamed and took off in the other direction. This thing began to laugh as I hauled tail behind her. I had no flashlight, and it was beyond me how Alice took off without running into anything. But of course, I managed to faceplant into the forest floor. I looked up, tasting the blood from my nose, and as I was about to take off again, this thing grabbed the back of my hoodie and threw me backwards. The impact of me hitting the ground knocked the breath out of me, making me want to cry. I took in a shaky breath when it grabbed my leg and pulled me close. It stared at me and screamed in my face, I love you, Vina. I grabbed the nearest thing my arm could reach, which was apparently a rock, and I smacked it as hard as I could in the face. It seemed to howl, and it stumbled backwards. I took off as fast as I could to catch up with Alice. We must have run over a mile with this thing crashing through the woods behind us before we burst out of the woods and scrambled back into my house. We locked everything down behind us, turning on all the lights. She finally got a good look at my face and told me the blood from my nose covered half of my face and most of my neck. Blood from my knees and legs seeped through my jeans and out the rips. She told me she thought I was going to pass out on the spot, but she did her best to clean and bandage me up. Alice and I just sat on my bed, not sure what to do after that. We didn't speak, not even when the dogs began to go crazy. Alice grabbed my hand as tightly as she could. The pain from my nose now gone, I could only feel the throbbing of my knees and legs. Something outside was tapping on the house and scurrying across the roof for hours. Eventually, Alice fell asleep, but I couldn't. Every noise made me jump. Every growl from the dogs made me want to soil myself. I felt so guilty. I knew what was in those woods, but I was just so wrapped up with Alice, I'd completely forgotten about how dangerous this thing could be. And it knew her voice now. It knew my nickname. I did not sleep the rest of that night, and at first light I woke Alice up and drove her back home, where we both passed out in her bed exhausted. Eventually, I went back home with Alice, and we stayed a few more nights, each night hearing that thing outside screaming and running around. I'll never again underestimate what is in those woods. The Creature on the Battlefield from B. Dowd, 62. I'm a 19-year-old guy. This story happened on a national battlefield. To be specific, Prairie Grove Park in northern Arkansas, right in the Ozark Mountains. On an early December weekend, I and hundreds of others would participate in a reenactment of Prairie Grove, Arkansas. My group of friends were all around my age and would always try to have fun on these weekends either going to a dance, drinking, or just walking around during scheduled times. It's a lot of fun. 
That weekend started as usual. Friday, everyone showed up and I met with all my friends. After we got dressed and formed into a battalion, we marched off to our camps. Nothing eventful happened Friday night. Many of us were just tired from driving so many miles. We were sleeping in big tents Friday night to keep warm from the icy winter winds. Saturday started off normally as well. We did a battle for the spectators, chilled around camp, and enjoyed ourselves. Come Saturday night though, that's when my life would be on the verge of death. After our mock battle, they sent my battalion into picket, which is taking the post and watching for the enemy. When it was my company's turn for picket duty, it was around 1 a.m. This usually lasted about an hour and a half. My partner and I were stationed on the farthest end of our line of pickets. Our left side was unprotected. Around 30 minutes in, we began to hear footsteps to the left side of us. We gathered our rifles and kept alert for any enemy pickets. After 15-ish minutes, we didn't hear anything and we let our guards down to rest. I lit my pipe and I began to relax. Then, all of a sudden, we heard a scream coming from behind us. Then there was another scream in front of us. Something was running through the tall grass we were guarding. We could barely see what it was. What we could make out was this large, dog-looking shadow illuminated by moonlight. We called out to the other pickets to fall back to our officer, but before I could begin the return, a huge rock was thrown at my back from behind me. It hit me, and I fell down, the wind taken from my lungs. I could see my partner running while I gasped for air. As I looked over to where the rock could have come from, I was left frozen in fear. This seven-foot-tall black creature was standing in the tall grass in front of me. It was a pale, rugged thing with black eyes, a slit for nostrils, and a smile as big as its head. Its arms were far longer than they should have been for its size, and its claws were dripping wet with what appeared to be blood, and I could only imagine where that blood had come from. After a few very long seconds, it took a step forward. I gathered my mind and courage and reached for my rifle, hoping to defend myself with my bayonet. I stood up, legs trembling so badly I felt I was going to pass out. I ran and ran as fast as I could then, but I could hear that creature following behind me. With every step it took, it made loud, heavy thuds. I could feel this thing's breath on my neck too. Too scared to turn around, I kept running until I reached my company. I nearly cried when I got there from the adrenaline rush and terror. They were wondering what the heck was going on. Apparently, they didn't see or hear anything that was chasing me, but I was certain that I saw fear in my partner's eyes. That night, they didn't make anyone else go on picket duty. I didn't sleep that night either, scared that the creature would come back. I stayed close to the fire, not for warmth, but security. When dawn broke, I found that I had three six-inch long cuts in the back of my coat. After getting the courage to go back to the scene, with a few friends, of course, we found a dead deer where I'd been stationed. It also had three long cuts going across its body. I decided then to just pack it up and leave. The drive back home was a silent drive. All I could think about was that creature. I didn't get much sleep the nights afterward too, putting a toll on my grades. I barely passed the semester due to sleep deprivation. I decided to take a six month long break from reenacting just so I could gather my confidence to sleep outside again. I know one thing. I will never return to that reenactment ever again, fearing that what I met before will not be so merciful next time. Something in the Dark From Anonymous 
I feel odd telling this story. Being a 40-year-old man now, with two children of my own, whom I tell all the time there is no such thing as ghosts or monsters, knowing that may not actually be true. Recent events forced me to move from Texas back to Florida. This is the place I lived as a child, where my parents still reside. After so many years have passed since that night, the night that began events that changed the rest of my life, I decided that I want answers to questions that are still stirring in my mind. Like closure when something traumatic takes place in your life. One day as I visited my parents, it came out. I asked my father if he remembered that night, the one that I still fear to this day. My father is 70 now. He had undergone recent brain surgery due to a hereditary condition. He's got pretty bad memory, but not about that night. The moment I brought it up, his smile immediately disappeared. He looked back at me with a strange look in his eyes. We only discussed the topic briefly before the subject was abruptly changed by my mother, but it gave me the confirmation I needed. As long as I can remember, during my entire childhood, we were a church-going family. Mom and Dad were not always that way. Later in my life, I would learn that they liked to party. They lived life on the edge, one day at a time. But things happened in life that caused them to make life-changing decisions. One of those causes for change was me. The night this event took place was a Sunday night. I remember this because we had come home from a late night evening service. I am not sure why most went to church, but as a kid, I enjoyed it. I would get to see my friends, and there was a girl at church I had a crush on. Not that I ever told her. When we got home, I went directly inside, changing into my PJs, brushing my teeth, and I went directly to bed, just like every Sunday night. My bed was on the right of my room when you walked in, and on the other side of the bed was a window, covered by a darker curtain. I had two windows on the opposite wall, sitting on the left and right, with my dresser right in the middle. On the wall to the left of my bed near the window side, there was a door that went into a very small closet. I always left it closed, unless I needed something inside. Now, my room was very dark, since the windows were covered by dark, thick curtains. At night, the only light in my room was from the hall light, which I left on until my parents came to check on me, because my parents would normally come by and tuck me in for the night. However, that night was slightly different. My mother was not feeling very well, so she went right to her room to lie down, so my father came in to check on me to make sure that I was in bed. I remember the first thing that hit me was this feeling. This was a feeling now as an older adult I would describe as being slightly drunk. Not knowing what that was at the age of 11, it was a very odd feeling that I didn't know how to explain to my father. So instead of speaking up about it, I didn't say a thing. My father said his goodnights and proceeded to walk out of the room. As my father began walking through the doorway, it looked like he was blurring, leaving part of himself behind, and that feeling hit me again. Still, I said nothing. I looked to the ceiling, then closed my eyes. But I didn't keep them closed very long. I wasn't feeling tired, so I opened my eyes and as they focused towards where my dresser was, I noticed it looked odd. It was dark. My father had turned off the hall light after leaving the room, but even in the dark, my eyes adjusted, allowing me to see certain shapes. I could make out the shape of my dresser, but oddly, something appeared to be standing right in front of it. Or so that's what I thought I saw. I won't lie, if I were in a situation where it was fight or flight, well, let's just say I would run out of my room screaming like a little girl. That's what I wanted to do in my head, but I was so scared at the moment, I couldn't even move. Before I knew it, my screaming made my father come in quickly. As he turned on the hall light, I swear to this very day, 
I saw something scurry quickly away from the light. Lying down, it was hard to tell just how tall it was, but if I had to hazard a guess, it would be about six feet tall. My father entered the room, asking, What? What happened? Lord only knows what was going through his mind at the time. I tried to tell him what happened. The feeling, the blurry figure he turned into, the dark, shadowy figure that was standing in front of my dresser and just skittered away. But he wasn't buying my story. At least, not yet. He told me that I needed to stop scaring myself and just go to sleep. Now, in my father's defense, I was quite the storyteller at age 11. That story of the boy that cried wolf just became my reality. I really disliked that story, more so after what just happened to me. After saying that bit, he turned and started walking out of my room, and it happened again. The blur, the light going off, me being terrified, but the feeling was stronger than ever, and I knew for a fact that I was not alone in my room. I turned in my bed, and there it was. This time, I jumped out of my bed and ran into my parents' room screaming at the top of my lungs. My mother told my father that he needed to go check my room to make sure everything's okay. I would later find out in life that my mother believed in ghosts. My father said fine, and went to my room to appease my mother's request. It was no more than two minutes later. My father walked back in and told my mother we needed to go stay at a hotel. He thought maybe there might be a gas leak, causing me to see things. I don't know if he realized it at the time, but I knew for a fact, even at that age, that nothing in the house ran on gas. But I was just happy we were getting out. I never returned to that house. My father made the excuse that it was unfit to live in due to a major gas leak. We moved to the home my parents still currently reside in to this day, but I looked back on this time in my life, trying to make sense of it many years later. Eventually, I got the answers to all my questions. Back to the day that I finally confronted my father about it. My mother had changed the subject as we talked, but she had left the room a while after that, and my father immediately brought it back up. He told me that there had been no gas leak. We were not forced to move as they had told me at the time. He said that the things that really happened that night still haunt him to this day. He said when he appeased my mother by going into my room to check, he planned to sit on my bed for a few minutes and come back telling me that it's all good and to go to bed. But when he entered my room, he realized it wasn't good. There was something evil, vengeful, inhuman, and he knew that its purpose was clear. It wanted something, someone, me. At one point, he even had a minister come out to anoint the home, to chase out the evil, to cast out this demon if that is what it was. I didn't want to tell my father, but to this day, I cannot get away from something. I do not know how to describe what it is, but it's not good. I've never told this story before, not even to my ex-wife of 19 years, but I think there may be others that hear this story, others who might have an invisible friend who's no friend at all. Over the years, things that have taken place are much more intense, much more terrifying. Another story for another day. Possible Wendigo in West Virginia From Anonymous I live with my aunt and uncle in Charleston, West Virginia. I had to move in with them for personal reasons. I live in a suburb with some forest around it, so not really near some big city. There's a creek that I like to walk to and fish in when the weather allows, so I know the place pretty well. This happened a couple of months ago, and it's the first time I've told this story to anyone outside my family. I am part Cherokee, as my uncle, father, and grandmas tell me. My mother's side of the family isn't. 
I think this is what gave me my instinct to get away from whatever I saw that day. I had one of my cousins from my mother's side of my family come to visit me over the weekend. I was 14 and he was 8. He loved spending time with me. I'm like a big brother to him. That day I took him fishing down at the creek that I was just writing about and we walked quite a ways down to one of my favorite spots. We started fishing for about 10 minutes when I heard a stick snap far up into the forest behind us. I thought it was a deer or another small animal, so we just kept on fishing. A couple of minutes later, I hear another but bigger stick snap. This time I could tell it was a bit closer to us, but still far away enough that I didn't worry about it. I still thought it was a deer stepping on something or a squirrel knocking a branch off a tree. We continue to enjoy fishing. About another 10 to 15 minutes later, we both heard something that sounded like what I thought was a deer or buck call right behind us in the tree line. By then, we were both freaked out and started to pack up when I heard it again from right behind us. Then, this horrible stench hits us. It smelled like the rotten corpse of some animal. This is when I began to realize what this thing might be that was scaring us. I told my cousin we needed to get up and leave now in a firm tone that I usually don't use to speak to him with. We then heard it again, and I looked back, and I saw this dark, skinny, tall creature jumping down the hill behind a tree. What I saw had to have been around seven or eight feet tall with these huge hands and fingers. We took off then, straight up the bank in front of us, cutting straight through someone's yard and onto the main road. We walked about five minutes away to my little neighborhood home. We got inside and we told my aunt and uncle, who were sitting in the breezeway smoking. Of course, they didn't really believe us, so we went to my room. My cousin left the next day, and after that I swear I've seen that thing out my window once or twice. It was always in a bush, always far away in the field past my backyard. I believe what I saw that day may have been a wendigo, and I haven't been back to that creek since. It comes when it rains, from just a simple username. This happened a few years ago. I am six foot one and pretty fit. I was taking my dog out at about 11.45 p.m. A light drizzle of rain was beginning to come down, when all of a sudden, I hear a strange sound. It was similar to the sound the apes made in the movie Planet of the Apes. Now I thought I was just hearing things. I live in Virginia. I know there are no monkeys out here. Finishing up, I brought my dog back inside quickly. I locked all the doors and closed the blinds just in case. Before long, I hit the pillow, and I was fast asleep. At some point, I woke up. I checked my phone, which read 2.33. I was wondering what in the world woke me up. I looked over towards the glass door that leads to a small deck. It didn't have a blind, so when I looked out it, I saw this dark shape just perched on the deck rail. Now the deck was two stories up, and the deck hangs off the house, so I was then wondering how in the world this thing or person got up there. I looked away just for a moment, and when I looked back, I saw the bright yellow eyes of the thing. I couldn't make out any other features, except for the cloth-looking stuff around its waist. I swear the moment I blinked, it was gone. This takes me to the second day. There was no rain that day and nothing odd happened. Three days after that, a heavy rain had begun coming down. I was able to take my mind off that weird creature I saw. I left my blinds open that day and fell asleep on the couch. I suddenly woke up to a cracking noise. I had left the outdoor lights on. I looked at the window, and there it was again, that thing from before, now trying to get inside. I got a much better look at this thing and I thought the devil himself was coming to get me. 
It had gray, sagging skin, too loose for its own body. It was very thin and tall, ribs sticking out like a sore thumb. The eyes were bright yellow, and the odd thing about it was it had these sort of antlers protruding from the head, and they had stuff hanging off of them. I looked at its body again. It looked decayed. Suddenly, it let out some kind of screech, and it was gone again. When I went outside the next day, there in the mud were some human-looking footprints, with coyote prints leading away. I wish I could say I never saw it again, but I did. About two weeks later, in the middle of the day, a light rain, much like the first time I saw it, came down. I spotted the thing again. It was standing in the field outside my house. Without a thought, I ran back inside, grabbing my 270 caliber rifle. I aimed at it and fired a single shot. I watched as that thing screamed that same god-awful noise, then went the other way. The day after that, I asked to stay with my parents until I found a new house, as I was definitely not renting that one anymore. I now live in Northern Virginia, and I've never had any problems since, but sometimes when I'm alone, I see those yellow eyes and hear the god-awful screech in the distance. If you live in the southeastern part of Virginia, I warn you, there's something that only hunts in the rain. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an eerie cast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's eeriecast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to eeriecast.com slash plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.